Well, hello and thank you for joining me for another ITY and Alex on Tech video. I have with me today Joe Kelly. He is the VP of International Media Affairs at Huawei HQ. And we're here during Huawei Seeds for the Future event. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much. So I thought I'd start at the beginning. Actually, tell us a little bit about yourself and your, your time at Huawei. Um, I've just passed five years. Wow, um, I arrived to work for Huawei five years ago. I'm a journalist by training. Mm -hmm. uh, worked as a journalist in the US and in Europe. Uh, this is my first role in Asia. I wow. can now, I guess, say I'm a global, global comms guy. Um, my job is to look after, I guess, the corporate reputation of Huawei mm -hmm. um, in all markets around the world except China. Right. My Chinese language skills are not good enough for that. Yeah, hey, <laughs> uh, I joined. I, I, I joined. I, uh, uh, I joined Huawei from BT. Uh -huh. uh, so I was with BT in London for ten years. Um, before that, I was with Xerox, yeah. uh, Marconi, mm -hmm. and I spent some time working for PR consultancies too. Sure, but there's strong history there in the world of telco. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I was writing about the internet before it existed. I was yeah. writing about mobile phones before they existed. I guess that says more about my age than anything else. <laughs> well, let's fast forward straight to the uh, coming 5G standard. Now, the standard's yet to be finalized, but that hasn't stopped companies like uh, Huawei and your major global competitors from doing a lot of work in bringing that forward. And uh, you've, you've recently uh, had a position paper on harmonizing global frequencies for 5G, and you've been pushing the 4.5G technologies forward. So what's the wrap on, on where Huawei is with 5G in late 2017, and when we should expect the standard to be finalized? Um, so we're, we're expecting standards 2018. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I guess your readers probably understand this. But There's been a lot of 5G. But telecoms article, is an yeah. industry that has never truly achieved a single global standard. Mm. Um, there's no consensus across the industry that a single global standard for 5G is a good thing. Mm. So we're, we're, we're all happy about that. Yeah. Um, 3GPP is the, the standards process that we support. Mm -hmm. uh, we think it's the right uh, approach. We're looking for efficiency. You know, standardizing mm. globally on one standard is a matter of efficiency. Yeah. Um, Spectrum harmonization is another matter of efficiency. Mm. You know, spectrum is like oil. Yeah, it's, it's valuable and limited. Mm. So anything that we can do to make it more efficient, to ensure that carriers aren't encumbered by you know, licenses for, for spectrum that mean that they can't use it freely for the services that they need to offer to their consumers. Mm. It, it basically undermines this valuable but scarce commodity that they have. Mm. Uh, so 2018 is the year for standards. Uh, 2020 is the year of commercial availability from them. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, we're getting closer and closer. You know, for the last several years, and I guess for the years to come, mm. there's an awful lot of testing going on. Yeah. Um, you must be doing a lot of testing in China. We're testing in China, we're testing in Korea, we're testing in Japan, we're testing in Canada, we're testing in the UK and many other countries. So, um, And we're testing in all kinds of environments. Mm. We've moved the testing away from the laboratories, out of the laboratories, into the field. Mm. And we have to test densely populated uh, metropolitan areas. We've got to um, test cities like Shenzhen mm -hmm. or Hong Kong where mm -hmm. the, we have lots of very tall buildings. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're testing in all different kinds of environments. Some of the speeds that we're getting in the tests are just remarkable, mm -hmm. you know, multiple gigabits. Mm -hmm. um, the stuff that, you know, if you go back 10 years ago, we probably never dreamt of possible. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, sci-fi stuff. We're now into the world of defying the laws of physics. Um, but it's very optimistic, you know, the, the, the industry is getting behind it. Mm -hmm. um, technically, we're proving the concepts that we set out to prove. Um, which are key and critical components into the standards agreement process. So um, it's becoming more real. We've been, we've been talking about 5G for quite a long time. In some ways, we're a bit like kids waiting for Christmas. Mm. Uh, but it does start to become more real now. So next year is the year of standards. And so uh, moving on to the other hot topic of uh, the, the last part of the decade, and that's IoT and narrowband IoT. Uh, and uh, of course people are still worried that IoT is the internet of hackable and crackable things as well as just the internet of everything. So what is Huawei's uh, position on uh, IoT and narrowband IoT in late 2017? Where, what are the plans for 2018 and where is security up to? The, um, I mean security has been an issue long before we talked about IoT. Mm. Um, globally cyber security is a critical issue. It's never hotter. It's, it's never, never been hotter, hotter than yeah. it is. But it's not a new topic. Mm. Um, so we are addressing security of IoT in much the same way that we've been addressing the security of networks generally um, mm. over several years. There's a huge amount of effort from Huawei and others. Um, we, we are a big advocate. Huawei cannot solve cybersecurity. No one company can, no mm. one country can. Um, we've been advocating for quite some time for a global approach, an agreed 
global approach to addressing the issue of cybersecurity. Mm. Um, that principle applies to IoT as well as it does to, to generally to network mm. security issues. Um, and it's going to be a continuous battle. Mm. You know, dealing with cybersecurity is that never ending. It's like painting the, the long bridge. You know, you get to the end, you start again because it's a, a dynamic process. Yeah. Um, Continuous improvement. We've, we've got you know, many of our research uh, experts working on how do we make IoT secure. Because um, IoT is a service on a network. Mm. Um, and of course, you start to move your security focus not just onto the network, but onto the device as well. Yeah. Um, interesting things. We think IoT, you know, if, if we think about what is 5G and why is 5G different, or the shift to 5G different from the shift from 3G to 4G? Shift from 3G to 4G was more about additional speed. Yeah. Shift to 5G is the machines. Supporting trillions of devices. Well, uh, 100 billion, I think, is the, the number that we've put forward yeah. for 2025. <laughs> well, I, was, uh, I was being optimistic. The, um, and, of course, narrowband IoT is a, a... Not all of the future IoT applications are going to require large bandwidth. Yeah. Um, you know, we've now got very cheap sensors. We've also got little batteries that will run for 10 years, so you can put it on a device and forget about it. Yeah. I mean, we've had M2M machine to machine devices running on 2G for well over a decade. Mm -hmm. So it's not as if this stuff is new, but it's, it's just what it can do and, and the power it uses and the things it can sense is what has improved. You know, I think you know, there's, a, the, there's the technical issue. And of course, almost nothing that we do is entirely new anymore. Mm. You know, it, sometimes you think it's about a process of continuous improvement. Yeah. I think maybe one of the more interesting topics on IoT or narrowband IoT is mm -hmm. can carriers find a way to turn that into new revenue streams. Yeah. Um, that's probably the more important discussion. Um, you know, for we, carriers at least. We, we all, yeah. For carriers, we all know that carriers are challenged with the loss of voice revenue, yeah. continued loss of voice they revenue. They don't want to be the dumb pipe, they want to be the they smart have, pipe they with have services. To, but, they, but, they, but they have to be revenue generating yeah, services. That's right. And um, you know, we are putting IoT into elevators so that the elevator company can do preventative maintenance. Mm. Um, so you know, one of the benefits is we're not going to get stuck in an elevator anymore because they'll have fixed the problem before it happens. Parking companies, uh, this is car park companies, are now mm -hmm. using IoT to allow us to go and pre-book our parking space mm -hmm. and pay for it using our phone. Yeah. I've, um, I'd, I've been doing that in Sydney, actually, with some of the parking. And Sydney, you get a discount. You know? Sid Sydney is clearly an advanced market. <laughs> um, the, um, so the business side of IoT is just as important as the security. Both are critically important. Um, and we're going to we're already seeing growth through four point five G. Mm. So many of the principles that we're embedding in five G, um, we're kind of bringing forward into four point five G. We're now offering in Hong Kong, and users can get one gigabit to their mobile device, yeah, which and, is an uh, incredible. Space. Um, you know, four point five G is the bridge from where we are today mm -hmm. uh, into the world of tomorrow called five G. So narrowband IoT critical for carriers um, because that could be a very valuable new source of revenue. I'll tell you an interesting story. Yeah, uh, please. In, in, in China, uh, working with China Telecom, and using a narrowband IoT, farmers are increasing the milk yield from their cattle, their dairy cattle, by 50%. That's mm -hmm. $420 US dollars per year yeah, per huge. animal. So and how are they doing that? Uh, they're doing it by using the sensors to test. I'm, I'm not a biochemist. Sure, they're sure. testing many of the physical um, parameters of cattle's yeah. behavior, and through that process and through the magic of technology and and, uh, and the analytics, biology, and the data that they're able to mine from that, allowing the cattle to produce more more milk. Oh. So that's real world benefits. So you know, we talked about IoT being relevant to carriers. Mm. It's also relevant to enterprises, and it's relevant to all of us. Relevant um, to you know, carriers, enterprises, and cattle. <laughs> and, and children. So and I, children, I look yeah. forward to the day when I can put a chip in all of my valuable things, yeah. uh, including my children, and know where they are. Yeah. Um, so no more wondering <laughs> where your kid is. Have they gone where they said they would be? They they have, if they've turned their phone off, you, they've still got the chip, right? <laughs> Correct. So um, I think IoT is interesting. It's still very early days. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. And, and we haven't even touched on the principle of industrial IoT. Yeah, IIoT. Where I guess that the bandwidth is going to be, the bandwidth requirements will be higher, mm -hmm. um, but the value will be there too. So, mm -hmm. you know, to some extent, we're moving into new territory. Mm. Um, at the same time, we're in this continual process of technology yeah. creating additional value, making mm -hmm. us more efficient, reducing the environmental impact of what we do. Um, I look forward to the day, I guess we all do, when 
we're all you know not driving our cars anymore. Mm. Uh, the cars are driving themselves we'll safely. So much we don't time have the latency of five G, the very low latency one yeah. millisecond. And um, we're we're looking at <coughs> um, integrated transportation. That means that we're not going to be stuck in traffic jams quite as much as we are today. Mm. Uh, and, and more and more people around the world are living in cities. So we can start to deal through 5G, 4.5G initially and then 5G, with some of the social and economic impacts that we have around the world and we're trying to address. Now, as we get towards the end of the interview, I always like to change gears a little and simply ask, what's the best piece of advice that you've ever received to help you get where you are today? Well, where I am today is China. Uh, and, and it's five years ago since I, since I arrived. Mm -hmm. And before I made the decision to come, I was living in the UK. Mm -hmm. I'm Irish uh, by birth. Um, I, I spoke to an old friend of mine who mm. had, is a China veteran and I said give me some advice if I decide to go to China and he said well I'll give you two pieces of advice one is go to Harbin yeah. for the ice festival which is where my father was born I went two years ago it was minus 30 degrees yeah. it, was, it was very cold and very <laughs> cold um, the other piece of advice was there's 1.3 billion Chinese people and there's one of you it might be easier if you're the one to adapt yeah <laughs> so have you learnt Chinese yet? EDNDM, a little bit. Um, I, you know, I live in Shenzhen, which is a very global city. Mm. Um, I work in a global organization called Huawei. And you look after the international side of I the, the But business. I can survive perfectly well in China with no Chinese language, yeah. but a translation app on my phone. Well, that's right. Huawei has its translation app. and Correct. You must, uh, must make life a lot easier. It, it does. But, yeah. I, but you know, if you, I, I'm a firm believer if you live in a different culture, you have to make some effort. Sure to learn the language Absolutely, because yeah. number one is a mar market respect to those who live here mm -hmm. and number two I think you gain more from the experience you do if yeah. you can talk to strangers on the street yeah so it's hard it's a very difficult language but I'm I'm in the spare time that I have I'm doing the best I can well as I was saying Chinese uh, which is very good and Fish so yeah <laughs> and so what's your final message for ITY viewers and readers and for your current and future Huawei customers at all levels we define the future as a world where all things are connected, mm -hmm. all things are sensing, and all things are intelligent. Um, so we're in the world of IoT, mm -hmm. we're in the world of 5G, we're in the world of cloud computing, we're in the world of AI and big data. And machine learning and, and all machine the rest. Learning. Yeah. Um, and it's a very different world from the one that we've been in. In fact, indeed, you're the Mate 10 Pro, and Mate 10 has the neural engine inside. So, I mean, you guys are pushing that forward it, it as we speak. Does. I mean, we're not the only people. No, but, um, but the industry there. is moving forward. It's always easy to go back to what you're comfortable with mm. rather than fully embrace the future. But, you know, I think we all have to embrace the future. Uh, our, our personal productivity depends on it. Uh, business efficiency depends on it. Arguably, the environment depends on it. Mm. And, you know... Technology is, is one of those things that when you learn to control it and when you learn to em embrace the benefits that technology brings, it can make lots of things better. So I guess the message is embrace the future, embrace the new opportunities, don't fear the future and move forward with confidence. It's like they say, uh, life begins out just outside of your comfort zone and it sounds like you and Huawei are both on that journey together, I doing so. very well. So I thank you so. very much, Joe. really appreciate My your time pleasure. and thank you. hope to talk to you again. Thank you.